Hi everyone, my name is Arun Venkatraman. I'm one of the founding engineers at Aurora and the lead of the Motion Planning Behavior Planning team. Today I want to talk about the value proposition of forecasting for motion planning. How does forecasting fit in with motion planning? And what mathematical framework can we think of that makes forecasting and motion planning a unified entity that we can think about for the system level as a whole? And with that, let's dive in. So at Aurora, our mission is to deliver the benefits of self-driving technologies safely, quickly, and broadly. We believe with our multimodal sensing capabilities from LIDARs, radars, and cameras, to the AI intelligence we're building inside of the Aurora driver allows us to build a product that can help deliver goods to the customers that need them and give passengers a comfortable and safe ride wherever they need to go. We have our technologies working on multiple platforms. Here you can see one of our trucking platforms uh, delivering freight goods. We also have our same AI technologies working on passenger vehicles as well for the ride hailing services and any other use cases we need in different operational domains such as highways and cities. So what really is it that makes the Aurora driver the Aurora driver? So uh, the Aurora driver, like other self-driving systems, takes a bunch of inputs on the left-hand side to produce three outputs on the right. So it takes inputs as LIDARs, the radars, the cameras, the map and vehicle state information, such as you know brake lights and uh, vehicle odometry. Uh, and in fact, it does a giant compression to move these into steering, throttle and brake, and turn signals so that we can show our intent to other actors on the, in the world. And if you think about data rates for a second, on the left-hand side, we have something on the order of half a gigabyte per second. And on the right-hand side, we're producing very low dimensional outputs. We're producing a steering angle of some sort, a longitudinal control of some sort, and a simple Boolean for a turn signal indication. And if you think about this, this is about 100,000 times compression factor. So what we're doing in the Aurora driver is taking all of these high density inputs and trying to compress them into produce just a single action per cycle that can contributes of these three components. So the core question of the Aurora driver is, how do I do this compression to figure out what actions to command at every cycle? From the inputs I see on the, on the road, how do I convert this into actions I should take? And we can actually develop a mathematical framework to think about this holistically. On one side, we have the state representation. We're trying to understand what is the state of the world. And on the right-hand side, we're trying to produce an action in response. And to do this, we can define a utility function, Q, which is a value function or action value function that defines the goodness of taking any action at any given state. And that really is the crux of the Aurora driver, is that it's continuously trying to figure out how do I maximize the utility, how do I maximize the value of taking any action? How good is it that I take a brake or throttle command? How good is it how much I steer? And should I turn on the turn signal indicator or not to show my intent? All of these together make up the Aurora driver. So let's try to break that down by talking about what state and action are in the concept of this utility function or value function. So we start off with the vehicle. Here is a, here's one of our older Lincoln MKZ platforms. It's booting up. Right now we have very basic estimation of state. We know, for example, what the brake light state is for the vehicle, or we might know some simple things like the gear and things like that for the vehicle. But this clearly isn't enough to do driving. If that's all I knew, um, the, my, almost like my blinds off, uh, blinds on my eyes, couldn't drive very well. The next thing to do is add basic sensing capabilities. So now we added cameras and, and lidars and radars. We have sensing of the world around us. But this still isn't quite state. I can't really just drive around if all I can see is, is this much information. Um, you and I, when we commute to work every day, we don't just drive only as the world is fresh to us every day. We might use something like a prior, like a map information. We know where we are in the world. And we use this to guide where we should go next. Knowing where we are lets us know where we need to go next. So the first step of making this state is using the sensor observations we have to guide us to where we are now. This is localization. But is this enough to now start driving? Well. You and I can look at this image, we, we, we do, and we segment it out, and we can segment it out to find objects in the world, and find things like the traffic lights, and then estimate the state of those elements. So for the traffic lights, we can estimate that the state is red in this case, and for other vehicles, we can estimate their position, the extents, how big are they. We can estimate their velocities, their accelerations, and so on, from the sensing capabilities we have. Um, and these are all important to help build up a state representation, which is a compression of all that I've observed so far, into a, into a denser representation that lets me know what I can, that helps me then define what actions I need to take next. So then that, that gives us state. So we have world state, we know we're on the map. We have vehicle state, we know a, a various odometry information about the vehicle. We also now have a perception state. We have ideas about the state of the world, traffic lights, vehicles, and so on. So then the question now is, what is actions in this concept? Where do actions fit in? And we can watch this play out in motion. So here, starting from the very beginning again, we can see 
the first two cars go because they have a green light and right as the light turns green you can see an actor actually cuts the red and the AV needs to make a decision that it should come to a stop that the other actor isn't going to come to a stop for it and it should go through and now we come across we're waiting at the at the unprotected left turn or UPL for short and a pedestrian crosses the intersection so now we need to make a decision that we should not try to cut the pedestrian crosswalk because we need to give them space to go and now finally the vehicles have come to a stop a gap is formed and the AV sees that there is now uh, it is now able to achieve its mission of completing the turning following along the route as predefined. So all of this end-to-end -end we're seeing is that we have the vehicle defining state. It's looking at all the objects in the world, finding their state, their velocities, their positions, and so on, and then finding out what actions it should take as a result given the state. And the challenge in all of this, what made this challenging, um, and this is sort of the obvious challenge in self-driving, is that the future of other actors is, is what affects what actions the AV should take and affects its utility. When we decided that we shouldn't go in front of the first actor and that taking that first slot that we marked with red, this was because we believe the other actor is trying to come across the intersection and they already have that intent and it's really their right of way. Um, so the future of what other actors are going to do really defines what it, what it's going, what's going to happen. For the actor very far away, we think it's mostly okay because we believe that the future of them gives them a chance for them to slow down if necessary. And for the actor in between, we're trying to decide what they are doing and if what they're doing allows us to take the action we want to take. And this really comes to the core of the challenge for self-driving is that in order for us to make an action, we need to know the future. So this therefore implies we need to have some concept of a forecasting system within the self-driving vehicle to have an understanding of what the future will be. So here's a common uh, example of a situation our self-driving trucks come across all the time. Here it is driving down a highway in Texas. And on the right hand side, we have a bunch of vehicles coming in to merge onto the highway. And the question we must ask ourselves is what slot, again, similar to the left turn we took earlier, what slot should the vehicle aim for here? And how good is that given what we think the world is going to do? So naturally, you might say that, well, in order for us to do motion planning, we need to have an idea of what, what actors will do, since that is clearly related to how good something is. Uh, so let me first go with perception. We'll figure out what the state of actors is. And then we're going to try to get a first level forecast of where things will be in the future and then afterwards it should be trivial to do planning on it. I just need to collision avoidance given the forecast. And so how does this look in the, in the classical way? So first we again we talked about we run perception first. So here we have the state of the other uh, actor. We simplified it to just a single truck and, and a single actor uh, merging onto the highway. So the first thing is perception runs. We get the state. We get velocity, you know, turn signals, hazard lights, so on. Uh, we then go into the forecasting stage. The forecasting system produces a forecast, here shown as unimodal, of where the actor will be. And this sort of thing naturally, almost naively, shows up in the data. We want to produce uh, a forecast for the actor that minimizes some sort of loss compared to all the data we've observed before. So what naturally could happen here? Well, if this is what is believed as the forecast for the planner, then the planner really has no choice but to try to break for this, for this actor. The planner must try to go behind this actor because the forecast tells it this is where the actor will be. Well, okay, we know that might not always be the case. In the case where we started in the very beginning, the actor was just right alongside the truck and maybe there's another world where we want the truck to go forward in. Well, so we can make our forecasting a little fancier. We might say there might be multiple outcomes of the world and try a, a multimodal forecast here shown as a bimodal forecast. We can get two examples here. We put two modes here, maybe a mixture of Gaussians or any other fancy uh, multimodal uh, prediction system we want to build and we may want to ask now okay so I have these modes of the actor distributions now I ask how should the planner respond to this well if I do something naive and ask it to do so in expectation we might get something that's still overly conservative to this behavior because um, we haven't asked ourselves fundamentally is this the right question to be asking here we've shown the distribution of p actor t to t plus h is just the marginal distribution of the actor's distribution given the state of the world However, at training time, our data was never collected from asking this question. Our data instead was collected as the vehicle drove, so we drove the truck in manual or even in autonomy, and collected a bunch of data of other actors around us, and then used that to fit a model of P actor. However, the data was collected conditioned on what the actual truck was doing at the time. The other actor, if they were to go in front or go behind, actually was related to what the truck did. And we can see this illustrated in this graph in this more visual uh, format. We can see there are multiple futures of what the car can do, but you and I looking at this can tell that, that that each of these modes is related to what the vehicle must have done online when that log was recorded, when the data was collected. Specifically, we can try to break this down 
into into two stages. There's the P actor given future given what the AV is trying to do. So in mode A, we can have that the AV yields to the actor, and this leads us to a distribution for the actor futures that's conditioned on what the AV is going to do. And in mode B, we can have where the AV is going ahead of the actor and get a forecast that's a function of this new future, this new conditioning of what the AV is trying to do. So in each of these cases, we're no longer saying that we're trying to make the marginal distribution of the actor behavior from the ob observed data. We can now ask the question instead, what is the actor trying to do considering that it's the AV? In many ways, this is what happens when we start thinking about joint forecasting systems within actor-actor interactions, but we must also ask the question of actor-AV interactions. And the moment we start asking about AV and actor interactions, we're really asking for the forecasting and planner interactions. And that is really the crux of this argument, which is that when the AV is doing its motion planning, it must account for the futures of the other vehicles as a function of what it's going to do. And that together helps us create the utility function for how good it is we take an action from any given state. So here we have in the top, we again have mode A, which is the AV yielding to an actor. And this helps us define the utility function. That function itself is a function of the forecast, which I tried to, to demonstrate here with saying the Q function is related to the dis joint distribution of both the AV and the actor. So if we condition on the AV trying to yield to the actor first, a discrete bit, we can find a utility function that tells us as a function of their forecast and our own speed, how good this will be. So if I'm trying to yield to the actor, I want to go slower. And if I'm trying to go ahead of the actor in mode B, I want to speed up to convey that intent. So this utility function captures more than just the naive forecast, but also captures um, intent prediction for the AVs. We, the AV needs to communicate its own intent to their actors so that we can get ourselves to go into the mode that we're trying to aim for. We want to yield to the, AV, the other actor, showing our intent early on, make sure the other actor knows to speed up as well. So this actor-actor interaction is also actor-AV interaction. And the way to unify all this is to think about it in terms of the AV's value function. So this is the key idea, is that forecasting must be in service of and joint with the AV's value function. We cannot do forecasting independently as, a, as an a priori step if we really need to make sure that the value that we, the AV does, the way it conveys intent to the world, the way it drives like a human out there, needs to be such that the forecasting system is aware of that interaction as well. And the way to do this is through the value function. And this is the Aurora approach for how we think about forecasting is that forecasting is intertwined with planning. We want to make the perception system feed into the motion planning system and have forecasting and planning work together to help define out what we think is the value function for various modes of behavior that, we, that could happen in the world. And then in continuous space, how do we think about how our actions, like such a speed that we can choose, relate to the goodness of how, how to take that action. And that's illustrated here. And going back to our, our more real world example, here's an example of the vehicle taking a relatively congested merge out in Dallas. And you can see here that it slots smoothly and comfortably uh, between, this, between these two vehicles. And if you notice at the very beginning, there's actually not enough gap in the slot for the full vehicle to fit. But over time, due to showing our intent, being assertive in the right amount to get to, get to the right speed, we're able to convey intent to other actors that we are trying to aim for the slot, and the gap helps makes itself. Whereas if we try to do forecasting a priori and try to come up with the different modes, we'd likely get much more conservative behavior. And we have seen often more conservative behavior. Otherwise, that forces the AV to stay back a lot more and not, not convey its intent, and therefore be more confusing to the world around it. So let's also create a natural behavior for the vehicle and be a good citizen of the road. And this is really where the value of machine learning comes in for motion planning, is manual tuning of this value function or the forecasts that play into how we construct it makes it very difficult for us to understand how we are doing relative to how the world expects us to evolve. Um, and you're really using data-driven methods and machine learning lets us think about from everything from the discrete decision space to the continuous application of those decisions, how does our parameters need to be moved to get the behavior we need end to end, including how the world evolves around us. So here we're seeing a great example of some discrete decision making happening where we can use something even simple like supervised learning to get an idea of what this Q function looks like when we think about supervised learning as a way to learn a policy. Um, we can then think about non-discrete methods and think about imitation learning even, and think about how do we know that the parameters we choose act more like a human. So here's a relatively mundane cut-in um, that happens pretty often on the highway. However, if you build an overly uh, conservative system here on the, on the description of the utility function, you can end up with over-braking, which can cause surprise to both um, actors behind us as well as actors in adjacent lanes and not realizing why the truck is braking so hard. So using human driving data, we can help develop 
what is the need for the forecast in order for us to derive a proper utility function for the planner to take? So we can tune all the parameters here relative to human driving data to get a better estimate of how to drive like a good citizen of the road. Here's another example of this happening during a merge where you can check different versions of software against the baseline human driving behavior shown as the green boxes. So here you can see the truck under different distributions, uh, different um, types of code acting very differently compared to the human in different cases. And we can use our data sets to help split based on various feature dimensions to, to have more introspection understanding of why our models are doing what they're doing. And we can build ones that are then closer to what we expect uh, other drivers around us uh, to see. So to summarize, the Aurora approach that we're taking here to planning is that we want to create a, a unionized mathematical framework that thinks about forecasting and planning together, um, as opposed to the classic approach of thinking of only uh, search and heuristics on top of, of pre-existing forecasting that, that could be learned but learned outside of the planner. And here, by doing so, we're able to create human-like behavior and nuances that help convey our intent to the world around us and act in an interpretable way. Um, we also want to make sure that our system is verified with safety guardrails on top of this, so we're not just relying on on machine learned models to do everything. Here, for example, on the very bottom, we have a, uh, an intersection where as the light turns green, a red light runner clears us and we're able to still make sure that we preserve the ability to stop for them. Um, and this sort of approach lets us combine the best of some engineering practices and what we have learned in robotics and, and motion planning historically with thinking about forecasting and motion planning together as a nuanced machine learned approach that's data driven. So as I conclude, I want to mention one, one thing and a call out to my colleague, Carl Wellington, who's talking at a different CVPR workshop is that we talked about how forecasting and, and the motion planning must be interlinked. There are some parts of what we might call forecasting, which can actually be pushed up into the perception side as well. For example, anything related to state. Again, that's where perception helps us a lot is estimation of state. And in some ways, a lot of actor behavior is not fully governed by the AV itself. Some of it is just innate to themselves, and that's state. Where, where's their meta objectives? Where, what lanes are they roughly trying to target independent of the AV? These are still valid questions to ask, but they should be asked in the sense of what is state in order to feed the utility function. And to summarize, therefore, the whole system as a whole is moving towards trying to understand what is the utility function and how do I take the maximum of this to find the action to execute on the vehicle. Um, I want to just thank everyone that at Aurora that's helped me build this understanding over the many years. In particular, thanks to Drew Bagnell, Sanjuman Chowdhury, Hilton Bristow, Cara Wellington, Paul Vernazza, Hyang Fan, Sai Elamanchi, Fletcher Marsh, and Karth Lexman. Thank you very much.